Welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness, thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Freeman Michaels here with Barnett Bain. And with our new music. I, I just love that music. I do too. I want to read another uh, Kubrick quote, though. Because well, really you're his biggest to fan. talk about the music again. <laughs> this is only the second time we talked about the music. How can we decide what comes from the inside and what comes from the outside? The extrasensory perceptions or hallucinatory projections? That's actually about The Shining, like the. Well, company. that's yeah. I know that they were. He was referring to uh, his own kind of metaphysical um, conundrum, but. What an incredible, incredible question to ask. Um, well, that is now 35 years ago, I guess. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So I, I don't know about you. I'll, I'll throw out my own um, experience of that, that there isn't a difference. Well, there is. There is no difference between the inside and the outside. And I think that what so many, what so many call the shift, the shift, we keep hearing the shift, the shift, the shift, I think that it, at least one of the symptoms of whatever that is that is being referred to as this shift of paradigms or of understandings of our relationship between this quote-unquote self and, and all that is, at least some of it has to do with the collapse of a inside and outside, a subject and an object. Uh, it's the Gospel of Thomas. That's twice in the last month I think I've alluded to that. Let's bring it up again. It's brilliant. It's a great, uh, great quote of um, attributed to Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas, one of the Gnostic Gospels, not part of the canon of four. Uh, and Jesus says, when you make the inside like the outside and the up like the down, the, the, the masculine like the feminine, when you make them all equal, when you claim them all, mm. Uh, that therein is power. That is that is the landing of of the kingdom of God. That is heaven on earth. Yeah, it's not out there. We're in it. This is it. We're it, it's it's um, it's a response, I think, to the same question. It's almost as if uh, as if he is responding to um, Stanley Kubrick as a stand-in for all of us. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and what I um, personally, the nightmare part of The Shining and the idea that I'm creating all of the nightmares in my experience, that they're all these nightmares, these fears are playing upon themselves and generating all these expressions that represent a kind of nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, that part is really palpable. Like, you know, is this real or is it being imagined? Again, it if doesn't you take make any a difference. We have some cameras in our little flip cams in our studio here. If we take, and I know everybody has played with a version of this. Right. If you take one camera and you point it at the other camera, or you take a camera and you point it at uh, uh, yourself on a closed loop on a, on a TV screen, it'll replay and replay and replay back into infinity images of yourself me shooting a camera shooting me shooting a camera shooting me back and forth and back and forth. it's like look it's like setting up mirrors but look reflecting back and forth on mirrors infinitely and um i think that that's what happens yeah uh in our consciousness and i, I that i think that's certainly what what the shining is for about me mm. uh, what the shining is about for me <laughs> right probably both or two right. probably it was equally true that that's what, that that's what that's what I'm about in The Shining, and vice versa. We're we're looking at ourselves, um, and looking at ourselves, looking at ourselves, looking at ourselves, looking at ourselves. That's what that's what well, The Shining as, was as about. A, as a head trip, it can end there, or not even end. It can be like that's okay. I get it conceptually, but what my sense is where this becomes an opportunity to expand is what we were talking about earlier when we are talking to Jay was the whole idea of compassion, curiosity. You know, at the end of the day, one of the things that I say to clients, uh, and it's sort of prescriptive, is can you love it? You know, simple, two words, love it. Love it. If you can love it, it expands the experience in a way that is very constructive. Now I can begin to be with it in, in a different 
uh, from a different vantage point. And, mm-hmm. and it's, it's interesting. I don't, th- this all, we'll have to put this together a little bit. That's what creates the presence. It's a level of ease, even with the disease, even with the, the discomfort, that, that makes it really okay, that makes it, that, that integrates it. You know, again, this word integrity. Can I really hold all of the aspects of me, can, you know, in a, in a level of ownership? We won't use the word responsibility. And level flip of it. Ownership. Yeah. And flip it. We were having uh, the beginning of this discussion also with Jay. Can I hold the downline? Hmm. Not really the downline, but can I? But can I also be held? Hmm. Hmm. Can I love those parts of myself? But can I also allow myself to be loved by the more of me? That's right. If there are these, if there are these, in, we're increasingly becoming aware of more and more aspects of ourselves. Um, largely lesser parts. Here's a part of me that is still in arrested development from something that happened at an early time. There's a part of me that is still caught up in beliefs and systems and emotional um, emotional patterns that I can't quite let go of, of betrayal or disappointment or something from another time in my life. If I'm aware of those and beginning, to, and, and you know, as you say, can you love those? Can I also flip it and realize, well, uh, is there more of me? Are there parts of me that are discovering me? Or, or is it more accurately, uh, they probably very wear, well aware of me. Am I willing to be seen by more of me? And am I willing to open up and develop a relationship with the more of me that I have uh, not yet been uh, either willing or ready or believed possible or had access to for whatever reasons can i love yes but can i receive love equally yeah it's beautiful it's beautiful because the shift that we were talking about in the earlier part of the show again the word presence where it becomes a presence it becomes a kind of uh it shows up very clearly as a way of being in the world with all these aspects of us. It's not a personality or a persona. It's not something we understand conceptually, you know, because that always shows up as in, incongruent, right? It shows up in a way, and lots of people in our, in our world have studied this stuff and they understand intellectually, but there's a lack of experience. It hasn't clicked in. And so it shows up, you know, kind of one dimensionally versus multidimensionally. And that frequency shift comes with an a very sincere acceptance, like a, a deep down love it, a deep down holding of the parts of us that show up. Because from the initial frequency, which Jay was talking about, of the resisting it and rejecting mm-hmm. it and judging it and denying it and like, you know, that kind of um, rigid responsibility, mm-hmm. which isn't, is nowhere near loving it, is nowhere near the frequency of being curious about it, nowhere near the frequency of caring about the parts of me or the, the part of, of my life that showed up in that way. That's not to say that we don't hold boundaries. Right. Um, you and I were at a meeting a few weeks ago and with someone who was talking about uh, their experience with the Dalai Lama, and um, the Dalai Lama was very clearly holds a boundary. No. Right. Um, you know, it isn't so. This this um, opening to love is does not mean we self abandon. No. Well, the Dalai Lama is picking up on presence. It's very interesting. What this person was saying was that they had a whole uh, a pitch, as it were, ready to go for the Dalai Lama, and but but before they even started on all of that, just in the initial exchange it was clean enough and clear enough that he didn't even get to do his pitch. The Dalai Lama said, sure, I'll do it. I'll do this thing. Mm-hmm. Just send it to me and, and we'll mm-hmm. do it. It sounds great. So there because are different, he wasn't, th- different th- modulators of uh, rapport. That's it. And uh, so all, the, all that I was saying there is, and this add-on is great, there are different modulators of rapport and we don't uh, dismiss uh, distinctions. There are still... There is still some um, uh, discernment about where love chooses to play. It's just yeah. it, it's it's 
not that it is it is not denying uh, anything, but it it does still have it does have boundaries. So he was saying the Dalai Lama was making his choices with other kinds of discernments. Yeah, and yet he had an appointment calendar. Not everybody threads the needle. Absolutely. No, what I love about that, and maybe we've changed topics a little bit, but maybe we haven't, is the Dalai Lama... Well, that would be unusual. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> His... Change lanes without this... Uh, Did you change uh, lanes without uh, indicating? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we do that often here. That's accepted. Um, is that his... What he's uh, utilizing to make decisions isn't rooted in what someone says. Mm-hmm. It's how they show up to say it. It's the presence that he's relating to. And that's why he, in this case, said yes you know, to the, the, the friend who was sharing with us how he got the Dalai Lama to do... To come to Southern California well, to do and go to, do a bunch of things and go to see Shamu at SeaWorld. That's right. He invited him to come with I his think family. he just wanted to go see Shamu. Shamu. Who doesn't want to see Shamu? Well, it's the quality of the experience that, that, that caused him to say, yeah, I'll do it. Um, and, and, and he made the point, this friend of ours made the point that... How many times he in the now he's known the Dalai Lama for 25 years and, and been around him in, in lots of different settings. How he also says no often, mm-hmm. and and again it's one of those things of the discernment factor of what fits and what doesn't. Love fit. sometimes says no, big time. It's important that love says no, yeah. And well, how often do you see Freeman um, people that uh, come into your world as a coach or mm. who uh, don't say no? Because Tons. they think it's they think that um, their um, understanding, uh, their relationship with wanting to be a spiritual, uh, is a, is tied into certain kinds of preconceived notions about uh, what it is to be good that are mostly conditioned, socialized, experienced, um, structured imagination experience, and so they're um, unduly accommodating. Right. And uh, and not quite as substantial as as is required to be in your life, in what matters, That's in right. the world, um, bringing through passion and bringing through compassion, and um, showing up. Yeah. I, I mean, it happens all the time. And there's levels of this at the at the at the you know levels of development. So for some people, the yes is a very codependent kind of people pleasing pattern. But it's interesting because I'd actually like to advance this uh, back to that kind of pendulum swing that we swing one way or the other. I, I, I don't think balance is about always being balanced. It's about a shifting and, and a constant shifting, right? What happened recently, you brought this up, was um, you had s- gone through a period of saying yes a lot to things. And then there came a point where yes was a distraction, You'd yesed enough. You were yesing in order to break through some limitations, self-imposed limitations, right? I said yes, finally, to somebody who invited me to contribute to a book on saying no. (laughs) So I'm saying yes to to pontificating about drawing boundaries and saying no. And I said, yeah, I have no time for that. I'll do it. I'll take that (laughs) on. But this is a this is an important uh, important distinction. This is an important uh, um, piece of the puzzle. Is the going from, you know, uh, the level of yes and no, and how we at one point are operating in a yes and no paradigm um, from a codependent place and wanting to be liked, and maybe we grow to where we're not doing that. That's not really what it's about. It shifts to uh, I realize how I want to open more to possibilities, so I'm going through my yes phase, um, which we brought up your yes phase, where you just determined at some point I'm going to start saying yes to things because I'm saying no. A, a lot of times, and so there was that that experience started right, um, and then the shift back to uh, okay, that was great, that was an interesting experiment. Now I'm going to go back to saying no because that's really important. And we'll see what happens uh, tomorrow and next week. I have no idea. And with that, uh, we've this, come. We to, have no idea. It's over. We've come to the end of something. <laughs> That was fun. It's always fun. The The show is a blast. Um, so many great shows and great shows coming up. Uh, so, folks, keep coming back to Cutting Edge Consciousness. We appreciate having you here. And, uh, and we'll keep coming back. Thanks for listening. <laughs>